Hi guys, welcome to the Dine at Home Takeover. Uh, I'm going to show you how we're going to prepare the box that I'm about to send to you. I uh, can't be more excited, I've been really busy this week. I've been in the kitchen here in Litchfield. We have been preparing, we have been cooking, we have been potting. And to be really honest, I'd love to know what you guys are going to do with this. I'm going to show you what my take is on this box, the way I would plate it up, the way I finished it. We sent you a couple of nice instructions, which will be a really clear guideline to how you should finish off this box. And it should be relatively straightforward. We've cooked everything, we seasoned everything. Just a few small points that are going to be really important to finishing off the dish the way I would really envision it. And I'm going to take you right through it. I'll show you all the little details. And I wish you was, have a lot of fun with this box, have a lot of fun with eating it, and I really hope you're going to enjoy it. So, first things, the bread and the goat butter. Really simple, make sure that you take the goat butter out quite a bit of time before, I would say at least 15 minutes, but half an hour is great as well. Have a little plate. The bread, they're gonna have to go into the oven. 180 degrees for about five minutes, which is gonna make it really nice and warm, nice and crunchy on the outside, and then with your soft butter, it's gonna be just delicious. So I'm gonna pop these in the oven, put the butter on the plate, and I'll see you in a few minutes. So there we are, bread has been in the oven for five minutes, really nice and warm, really nice and crunchy, and we put the butter on the side, ready for the start of your meal, next to your starter, or just before that, it's all up to you. So, we're gonna start with preparing the starters. We have, I put it all on a tray, makes it really nice and easy to keep track of what you're doing. I'd say I'd recommend at home as well, separate your ingredients and make sure that you have it a little bit organized. It's gonna make your life a whole lot easier when you're actually finishing your starter and your main course. You will see there's a lot of pots in this box. There's a lot of different things, lots of really delicious, yummy items. And if you keep them organized, Whilst you're finishing your dish, it will be quite a bit easier. So, we have wonderful, nice scallops that we're going to pan sear. We have a lovely, salty, strong miso paste that's going to be the body of this dish. We have crunchy and refreshing pickled watermelon rind, shiso cress for a peppery note, apple puree for a little sweet and sour relief. And then the sea bakton vinaigrette, which is going to really bring this dish together and make it all a nice, punchy, refreshing and yummy starter. So, none of this has to be really heated up. It really has to be on room temperature. So make sure that you have taken this out 15 to 20 minutes before you start cooking to have the right experience. I'd say it's almost like... Uh, like a refreshing starter so we want to have these scallops really nice and hot and well seared and then all the little garnishes are going to be on room temperature so it makes it nice and easy and I'm going to show you how to do the scallops so we're going to pan sear the scallops nice and warm pan medium heat but put it on in time you want that pan to be really nice and hot you don't want fumes coming off or be really boiling but it needs to be hot because we want to sear these scallops I'm gonna put a little drop of oil, not much, just to coat them. And a sprinkle of salt. You can only do this just before they go into the pan because the scallops and the, or the salt are there going to bite into this really delicate meat from the scallops, which we don't really wanna have. So it's a last minute seasoning. Tiny bit of oil. And then we wanna make sure that that pan is really nice and hot. Great way to just check whether it is hot or not. You want to be feeling that heat coming off the pan. You don't want to be able to hold your hand here too long. It needs to be ready to sear. I think that's about right. And then put them on the top side. You 
this is obviously a one person portion if you have two you'll have six scallops if there are three you'll have nine and um, you can all do them in one pan make sure that your pan is big enough you really want to keep that heat in the pan because if they if the heat uh, goes down too much they won't really get a nice sear and they'll start to cook in the pan and it's not really what we want to have we really want to have them hot in the pan just like a big pan and get them in there like that they really don't need much time either. I think it's about a minute on each side, and then we'll just take them off the fire, and they will just uh, slowly cook through in the pan whilst we're gonna be plating up. They're seeing beautifully here like this. You see the smoke coming off a little bit. It's not too hot, but they're definitely not boiling in the pan. I'm gonna turn them over. There we go. Often when I do scallops, I will add a little bit of butter to the pan. But for this specific dish, I choose not to because it's a really refreshing dish and it has elements on the plate that in my opinion just do perfectly fine with just this light seasoning. It's almost like an a la plancha preparation that we're doing with the scallops. If you're really fancy, Add a little bit of butter, bask them nicely in it, and you'll have great scallops as well. But in this case, not necessary for the dish. You can feel with your fingers as well, they start to build up a tiny bit of resistance, and that's why we know when they are absolutely ready. So I'm going to take them to the other side, and we're going to finish up with plating. So there we are, we're going to finish the starter, we're going to start with all the little garnishes while the scallops are in the pan, just slowly taking that heat all the way through the middle so they're going to be perfectly cooked by the time we are done. We're going to start with the miso, now this is strong, this is a bit salty so be careful not to put too much, but you kind of want to make a little base in the plate, do it the way you like, if you have a flat plate you can spread it out a bit more gonna give a really nice and salty base to this dish. Then I wanna take the apple puree, which is gonna be the relief of that saltiness, and that's what I kind of look for. You don't wanna have contrasting flavors and contrasting textures in, in a dish. So with that really salty miso, we're gonna add some refreshing sour apple puree. Then, we're going to add these beautifully seared scallops. Plate them the way you like. I have chosen to take a deep plate, but you can have a flat plate, you can have a round plate. The way you like. We want to be adding a few of the cubes of the pickled watermelon rind. This is a pot for two, I'd say. I think you need about two pieces of each scallop. Nice and refreshing. Really delicious. The shiso cress for a nice peppery element. Get them all in there. And then last, to finish it off, the sea buckthorn vinaigrette. Give it a good stir. There's oils and liquids in there that were separated. So you're just gonna need a tiny bit of a stir. And then we can, I'm just gonna drip that on to your seared scallops. A little bit around. And there it is. This is my pan seared scallops with miso, green apple puree, shiso, and pickled watermelon rind, and a sea buckthorn vinaigrette. 
All right, that was the starter. I think we are ready to start finishing our main course. So we have the steak that has been out of the fridge for, let's say, at least an hour. We really want that to be on room temperature. So when we're gonna be searing it in the pan and we're gonna be putting it in the oven, it doesn't need much time to get a nice warmth inside. We wanna be having it for medium rare, about 56, 58. Uh, for medium around 60 and if you want to have it more cooked you're gonna have to take it a little bit more time regardless having that meat at room temperature is gonna make a whole big difference for whatever cooking you desire so we're gonna start with this beautiful steak it's vacuum packed it has some beef fat it has some rosemary all we need to add is a bit of seasoning some pepper and some salt and then we're gonna be putting it in the pan nicely searing it adding a bit of butter roast the meat nicely and then we're going to be adding the sauce to that so we take all that flavor from the meat and from the roasting and incorporate it in that sauce to make just a really nice beautiful sticky sauce for the other items that are going to be on the plate we have the oxtail we have the aubergine chutney we have the sauce obviously we have a roscoff onion which we're going to cut in half and we're going to fill with the oxtail and heat it up in the oven we have a little bit of black walnut uh, dressing that we're going to be adding to the chicory and a little bit of bull's blood leaves for the decoration of the plate. So, most importantly, we're going to be starting with the steak. You open up your bag and take the meat out. Bit of rosemary that is in there that is to marinate the steak but we'll also want to put that in the pan afterwards but you just can't do it from the beginning because it will burn so we're going to sear the steak first and then last when we add the butter we're going to put that rosemary in and we're going to give a real nice fragrance to to the pan to the butter and be incorporated into the sauce afterwards Seasoning, something really personal. I can't really tell you what you have to do, but I like a bit of seasoning on my steak. So we're gonna put nice salt, coarse pepper. And we're gonna put it on the other side as well. Nice bit of salt, nice bit of pepper. Delicious. Rosemary bit on the side, that's for later in the pan. And I'm gonna take you to the stove where I'm gonna be showing you how to grill the meat. So there we go, searing the steak. It's a, it's a job that you need to take serious, I think. This is where you can really make or break this dish. And if you follow the instructions nicely, you're gonna have an absolutely perfectly cooked steak like you would get it in a top restaurant. So it's a point where you need to pay some attention. And once you master this, you can bring it into any type of meat cookery, fish cookery or chicken. You wanna make sure that your pan is hot. You wanna make sure that you don't sear it too long or too hot and you want to be taking that heat down a little bit once you add the butter so the butter doesn't burn so we'll show these little tricks and if you follow this well you're gonna have an absolutely smashing steak at home so the steak is well seasoned and start with a little bit of oil you can put oil in the pan i prefer to season the meat and, and oil the meat because you don't want to have puddles of, of fat going around Just a touch, don't need much. And there we go. Really nice hot pan. We have it over a medium to high heat. You really want to have that heat in the pan as well. We don't want the pan to cool down too quickly once you add the steak because it's going to be boiling in it and we don't want that. We want searing. You can, you can feel that the heat is right. You can smell it, you can see the smoke coming off, the steak is searing nicely. This is perfect. If you feel that it's not really getting this, just crank up the heat a little bit and make sure that there's enough power under your pan. You always want to be looking at a thick bottom pan. Anytime you go out shopping for pots and pans, make sure that you have a nice thick bottom so that when you put something in it, it retains the heat and it doesn't just cool down right away and become a mess. You see, because we have a sirloin, there's a nice fat layer on the top, and this is delicious. But we need to make sure that we take care of that fat. We need to render it down, we need to 
made, uh, I mean, to sear it a little bit. So once we've done the sides, we're going to be putting it on that nice fat layer and completely cook it through. So that fat is nicely cooked and it's going to be melting in the mouth and it's really going to be adding all that flavor to the meat once you eat it. You see there, it has a nice crust, it has a nice browning. couple of minutes on each side, it really doesn't need much as long as that heat is there. We'll give it a minute or two maybe, maximum. Now I'm going to be turning it onto the fat side and I'm going to hold it up nicely, make sure that you render it down completely. Really important that you follow these steps closely. They're nice steps as well. These are some of my favorite parts of the cooking when the beet goes in the pan and you can smell it and there's butter going in and all these lovely aromas. We're going to be finishing the sauce and all these roasting flavors that are in the pan. It's a bit what Chef's Life is all about. We've done some real good searing here. I'm going to take it off the fire, just leave that fat to render down a little bit more. But the main thing is that we're going to reduce the heat because we want to be adding the butter. You don't want to add the butter in a boiling hot pan because it's going to be burning and it's going to be bitter, which is not nice. And we really want that butter to become part of the sauce and we'll bind it nicely together. All the fat that is released from the sides of the sirloin, we're going to be uh, discarding that. We don't really want that in the sauce. We want nice, fresh fat. We want that beautiful flavor from the butter to come through the sauce. So I'm going to be pouring it off in a little metal container or stoneware, not straight in the bin because it will be really, it'll burn through everything. Lovely, crunchy, crispy, perfectly rendered. That's going to be delicious. Time to add a few bits of butter. Pan is cooled down nicely, so that's exactly what we were after. And then we'll also be introducing the thyme. This is now going to really flavor that butter and the fat. I'm going to go into the sauce. Not too much, we don't want it to burn, we just want to make that, that butter go and pass the meat in it. And you can use a spoon, any of them. And there we go. You can really smell that rosemary all in the kitchen, it's just gorgeous. sides, make sure that the browning, nice golden brown. And then we're going to take the meat out of the pan, we're going to leave it to rest for a couple of minutes before it goes into the oven, and we're going to be adding the sauce to the pan. There's a nice big pot of sauce, we're going to be using all of that, it's delicious, you'll have loads of meat, so that sauce is really going to make your dish. At this point, you can turn the fire off. 
we don't want to reduce the sauce too much. It's already a full flavor. It's already at the right consistency. We just want to be mixing it up with the butter with all the roasting flavors. And we're going to leave it on the side. Once the meat is done, we'll heat it up gently and we'll just pour it over on the dish. And you're going to have a lovely sauce that has everything in it. All the flavors that we created by roasting the meat like this are going to be in this sauce and it's going to be amazing. Now I'm going to take it to the other side. I'm going to prepare all the other garnishes for the dish while the meat goes in the oven and we have some time to play them. All right, time to go for the garnishes. So we have the oxtail, the Roscoff onion that we have already cooked. You're only going to have to follow the steps that I'm going to show you right now. We have the aubergine puree, which we're going to heat up gently in a small sauce pot. And we have the chicory with the black walnut dressing, which we're going to be cutting it and mixing it super easy but a real nice refreshing touch to the dish so the one thing that's going to take a little bit of cooking here or a little bit of work is the onion the idea is to cut the onion in half we're going to want to take out some of the inside And we're gonna fill that up with the oxtail. Now, if your oxtail is really set because it's full of gelatin and full of nice uh, sauce, you can put it in the microwave for let's say 20 seconds. That will soften up the stock and the gelatin and will make it easier to fill your onion. And we're gonna use, we're gonna to wanna to use everything. Take all that lovely oxtail. Fill up your onion. And I'll put that on a small oven tray. And we're gonna heat it up in the oven. We'll also take a small saucepan where we're going to be putting the aubergine uh, chutney in. We'll heat it up gently by the time the meat comes out of the oven. So that's perfect. Then the final preparation for this dish is the chicory. Really simple, you're just gonna have to cut it up. You can cut it up the way you like. I'm going to show you the way I would do it. And we're going to be mixing that with the walnut dressing just before serving. But now the meat is cooking, it's the right time to get this going. Because on the last minute of plating, you'll have your hands full. So I'm just going to cut that in half. And kind of cut it lengthwise. bowl here put that in lovely now we're going to look at the meat has been in the oven for the last four minutes it should give us the the right amount of cooking this is gorgeous like that so we put it in the pan we've roasted it We've rested the meat for about five, six minutes, and now it's been into the oven on 108 degrees for about four to five minutes, which should give us a perfect medium rare. If you want your meat a little bit more cooked, leave it to rest first, and then put it in again. It is always good to give the, the meat the time to rest and for the heat to go in gently. Even if you like a medium well, bring that to the temperature in a in a gradient matter, so it doesn't contract too much, doesn't push out all the, the lovely juices. Feel a little bit if you can feel that resistance from the meat, but like this is perfect. We'll leave it to rest for a little bit and we have time to go and finish up our final garnishes. So we'll have the aubergine compote, the Roscoff onions, and I'm gonna be taking you to the other side to show you how it's done. 
All right, ready for the plating. So we have the Roscoff onion with the oxtail warmed up. We have the aubergine compote warmed up. Our meat is nicely rested for a couple of minutes. That's gonna be perfect. I'm going to be mixing the chicory salad with the black walnut dressing. So we have that ready as well. Gonna make a really lovely, refreshing element on this plate. The black walnuts have a unique flavor and the chicory refreshing and crunchy. So we'll start with adding one of the onions to the plate. Your nice warm aubergine chutney compote. Another part. And then the meat, you want to be taking nice equal slices, making sure that everybody gets the same. We're going to start on this side, beautifully carved. The steak is obviously for two persons, we're only going to need one. We're going to take about half of that beautiful meat and put it on the plate. Space them out a little bit so you can expose that beautiful interior. And then that delicious sauce. So you can see it has emulsified. The butter that we use for the roasting together with the sauce has emulsified beautifully and made this lovely nice thick sauce. I'm just gonna scoop all over the over the meat. That's gonna be delicious. Use it all up. I'm a real big fan of sauces, put a lot of effort into making this sauce and making it absolutely perfect. So make sure that you use every little bit of it because it will just make the eating experience so much better. And then last, we want to add a little bit of the chicory salad. Nice and refreshing. And a few bits of the bull's blood leaves. And there we go. A little drip. Make sure you clean up your plate nicely so it looks pretty. And there it is. Your beef sirloin with Roscoff onion, oxtail, aubergine compote, chicory and black walnut salad, and a red wine and Madeira jus. So there we are at the grand finale. We're gonna go to the dessert. Really few simple items on the plate that are going to be delicious. We have the yogurt and thyme sorbet. We have the white chocolate mousse with the fig chutney the porcini biscuit, porcini soil, and the bee pollen to top of the ice cream. So we're gonna start with putting your porcini biscuit on top of the mousse. And then we're gonna dip this mousse into a bit of hot water so it releases the gelatin from the sides and we can pour it upside down onto the plate. Just a couple of seconds, shouldn't take too much. There you go, there's your mousse. Then we're gonna be placing a spoon of the porcini soil right next to it. Quite a bit, it's really delicious and crunchy, has texture. And your ice cream is gonna go there as well. Right in there. And then we'll finish it off with a couple of bee pollen. Of the mousse. Of your ice cream and that's the final dessert a white chocolate mousse with a fig chutney porcini biscuit yogurt and thyme sorbet bee pollen and porcini soil 
And then there's only one more thing that we'll be sending you home. It's a little treat. It's a star anise and a chocolate fudge, which is gonna be really delicious to enjoy with an espresso or digestive or whatever you fancy after your dinner. But I really hope you guys enjoy. I'm really grateful for everyone that has bought a box, for everyone that has put their faith in us to make something delicious and beautiful. It's gonna be a really nice weekend for you guys. It's gonna be a really nice week for me. I've thoroughly enjoyed being here in Litchfield. The team has been amazing. Dine at home, Litchfield have been doing a stellar job for the past, I think more than a year they've been going with this. And to do this takeover of the kitchen, but also have their support to make this a success has been great. And I hope you guys have just smiled, just as a great experience as I, as I have had here. And I'm looking forward to your pictures and to your comments. Would love to hear what you think. Would love to hear if you enjoyed it. And Thank you very much.